the Buddha had a very active sense of the truth. True things, he said, don't exist in isolation. They're part of a causal chain. They come from previous conditions and they affect conditions that come after them or together with them. And as for the truths we talk about, the truths that can be taught, those are active too. They have an impact on the person who listens. They lead to certain kinds of actions. And the Buddha also had a sense that there were something that was false could not be useful in a genuine sense of the term. There's a passage where he talks about different kinds of speech, speech that is true but not useful, speech that's true and useful. And then there's a question of whether people like to hear it or not. But there's no category for things that are false and useful. What this means is if you want to find a truth, one way of testing it is to see the impact it has. If it is genuinely, genuinely useful, then it's a truth. And this is why the, the Buddha said that his teachings should be put to the test, because this is how you can test them, to see what impact they have on your behavior. If you take a teaching and put it into practice, what does it do? What do you do? And what are the results of what you do? If you find that they really do have a good impact on the mind, that's a truth. For instance, the teachings on karma. The teaching that when we act, one, there really is such a thing as an action. It's not a delusion. It's not unreal. And secondly, that we are responsible for our actions. Particularly, there's a mental event that causes those actions, and the quality of the act is going to be determined by the quality of the mind state that causes it. And the Buddha's proof for this, process, this principle is what happens when you put it into action. I think what would happen if you didn't believe it, that your acts didn't really matter or they really weren't true, or the idea of a good or a bad action was some, somehow a fiction. Imagine what, the way you would act, or if you felt that you could do something but then hope for some higher being to come along and forgive you and erase the results of that action. How would you act? If you believe in the principle of action, then you're going to be very careful about what you do. You're going to check the results, and anything that you've learned where you've made a mistake, you can take that as a lesson. A mistake here being that you've harmed either yourself or the people around you. That's the, the way that teaching is put into effect. And you see it. It really does have a good impact on the way you act. You become more and more skillful. You create less and less suffering for yourself. That's how the Buddha proves the principle of action, proves the principle of karma. He doesn't cite his own memories of previous lifetimes or talk about proof that someone can have a consciousness that goes from one life to the next and then remember what had happened in previous lifetimes. That's not the proof. When people say that all the Buddha's teachings have to be proved in an empirical way, they use this usually as an argument against the principle of karma, against the principle of rebirth. Most people can't remember their past lifetimes, therefore they can't prove the teaching, therefore it's not a relevant teaching for them. That's the line of reasoning. 
But that kind of empirical proof is not what the Buddha had in mind. His proof was more pragmatic. Take a teaching, put it into effect, and see what results you get. You get good results, that's a, that's a true teaching. But he also has room for what he calls individual truths versus noble truths. Sometimes you hear about the idea that the Buddha taught two levels of truth, but the only time he makes a distinction between two types of truth, it's this one. Things that are true for you individually and things that are true for everybody across the board. That's one of the reading, meanings of noble in the sense that it's standard. And as we're meditating, we're trying to sort out what are our true things for us individually and ultimately get to the, the noble truths, things that are true across the board. In other words, you find when you meditate, you focus on your breath like this, you focus on the breath like that, it works gets good results. And in the beginning you're dealing an awful lot with individual truths, because sometimes a particular focus or a particular way of conceiving the breath is going to work for one session. In other words, it works for a particular problem. And uh, next time you sit down and meditate, it doesn't work. It's because you've got a different problem. That approach was true for that particular problem. But then you've got to realize you come up with different problems from time to time. And so what you have to do as you meditate is take note of what you've learned from each session of sitting meditation or walking meditation, and then test it the next time around. And if it doesn't work the second time around, you can chalk it up either to the fact that you weren't observing very carefully the first time, there were things that you missed, or that it was a solution to a different problem, and you've got a new problem this time. And this way you begin to build up your, your body of knowledge, your body of individual truths. But as you work with them, you find that they head more and more towards the Noble Truths. You learn to sort, sort things out in terms of stress and its cause, the path to leading to the end of stress and the actual ending of stress. It's when you hit that last one, which is formally the third Noble Truth. That's when you know that you've hit the Noble Truths as a whole. You've understood them properly. You've performed the right task, appropriate e each. Even these truths are active truths. Stress is something you want to comprehend. Normally we want to run away from it or push it away. But the Buddha tells us you've got to comprehend it. If you don't comprehend it, you can't get past it. It's like that riddle of the Sphinx. The Sphinx stands across the road, and anyone who comes up and can't answer the Sphinx's riddle gets eaten up. But if you can answer the riddle, you get past. It's the same way with stress. You've got to be able to answer the riddle of stress so that you can get past it. Because as the Buddha said, our normal reaction to stress and pain is one, bewilderment, and two, a search for a way out. And the only way you can get beyond your bewilderment is to be in a position where you can sit and watch it. And the only way you can do that is to put the mind in a position where it doesn't feel threatened. That's what the path is all about, particularly the heart of the path, right concentration, putting the mind in a state of ease, even rapture, focused on one thing, gives the mind a sense of power, a sense that it has a safe place to go. When you have this sense of a safe place to go, then you can begin to probe into things that you would normally be afraid of.
to make another comparison, is like fighting a dragon. If you know you have good, strong armor and the dragon's breath can't burn you, then you can probe. So this is why concentration is such an important part of the teaching, an important part of the path. It gives you that position of strength. It gives you that sense of confidence that when things get difficult, you don't have to worry. It's one of the reasons why the Forest of John's always recommended going out into the forest. Because you get out there, there's all kinds of things that can happen. And if you sit there worrying about them, you can't stay. You end up running back. And you begin to realize, though, so if you have your wits about you, that if you can get the mind in a state of concentration, it's not going to fixate on all the dangers and all the problems. So that's one level of problem that you can overcome, your fears. Secondly, when difficult things actually happen, you find that you can withstand them with your concentration. There's a great passage in the Theragata where the monk is reflecting on the fact that he's he's got some pretty bad pains. He's really sick. What are you going to do? There's no medicine. There's no doctor. There's nobody around to help. As you stay there in the grove, what are you going to do? Are you going to run away? Well, he says, no, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to focus on the four frames of reference and the seven factors of awakening. That'll be his mind's protection. In other words, he realizes that his safety lies in looking after the mind. You look after the body to the extent that you can, but then you have to realize this this is a dying body. It's like those cars that they make with planned obsolescence. It's designed to fall apart at some point. And if you run around worrying about this all the time, there comes a point where no matter how much you worry about it and how much you try to fight it off, it's still going to go on its own. Your only safety lies in developing these qualities of mind. Sometimes the power of mind can actually heal the body, but there will come times when it can't. But still, at that point, it doesn't matter when the powers of the mind are really strong. So this is why concentration is something you want to develop. Again, sometimes you hear that when you're meditating and being mindful and a good, strong state of concentration comes along, you have to be wary of getting attached to it. Just let it come, let it go. And somehow in that way you transcend it. Well, that's not what the Buddha taught. Concentration is to be developed. You take time, you work at it, even if it involves a certain amount of attachment. It's attachment to a good thing. It's like holding on to the rungs of a ladder. You don't want to let go of one rung unless you've got your hand on another rung. Or until you've finally reached the, the top of the roof, you can get off the ladder and then you're safe on the roof. As John Fu once said, don't be afraid of getting attached to a state of concentration. Be afraid that you won't get to the concentration or that you won't be able to maintain it. Once you're there, once you're attached to it, to it, then you can work on the attachment. So the path is nothing to be feared, after all, the Buddha said. Concentration is nothing to be feared, as the Buddha said, it's something to be developed. And it's in this way that you prove the truth of his teachings. You work on them and you find that it really does lead to the end of suffering. That's when you've got your proof. Up to that point, things haven't yet been proven. Certain things will give you a sense of confidence. You see results here and you see results there. But it's only when things open up to the deathless, that's when you've got your proof. That's when you know for sure that what the Buddha taught was true. There is a deathless and it can be attained through human effort. But it requires that you, too, be true. You have to be honest in your effort. 
when your effort doesn't measure, measure up to what he taught, you can't say that you've proven his teachings wrong. You've simply tried a little bit. But you haven't done enough yet to prove them. And whether you're honest with yourself, that's how, how you can keep at the path. In other words, in order to know the truth of the Buddhist teaching, as a John Lee once said, you have to be true too. True in the active sense. Not just knowing true things, but true in your actions. And the proof of your truth, too, comes when you hit the deathless. That's the point you, when you can know that you can rely on yourself. As the Buddha said, someone who's hit the stream in this way will never intentionally do anything wrong because they've seen the principle of action, the truth of action, and the action of truth. And they'll never intentionally be false again.